I would like to call the College of Complexes into session tonight. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the weekly gathering of the College of Complexes. Tonight our speaker is David Ramsey Steele, who's going to be talking about belief. The college consists of the following format. The first is we have a brief announcements period, then our speaker will speak, then we will have a question and answer period. After that, we'll have our infamous open microphone period. And tonight we have David Ramsey Steele speaking on how belief systems work. Examples of belief systems include Scientology, Seventh-day Adventism, Marxism, Global Warming, 9-11 Truth, the Paleo Diet, Zen Buddhism, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, Romanticism, Darwinian Evolution, and Feminology. Religions, political ideologies, conspiracy theories, scientific theories, popular diets, brands of psychotherapy, doctors about the art, and psychological schools. These are all belief systems. To tell us all about it, if David Ramsey Steele is ready, let's give a warm round of applause to David Ramsey Steele and how belief systems work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Fellow members of the human species, anybody else who may be paying attention? Is this mic working? Yeah, it's working. Good. Yeah, you're um, <clears throat> Well, um, I want to talk about belief systems. Uh, this is something that has, um, I've been thinking about all my life, and it's quite a long life. Um, when I was Ill, just 11, my father had a born-again experience and became a, an evangelical Christian. And that plunged me into the world of evangelical Christianity. Um, and then between the ages of 11 and 13, I moved from evangelical Christianity to a kind of modernist Christianity to atheism. By the age of 13, I was an atheist. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't leave home until I was 70. And then I joined an atheist society. And one of the first things I noticed about this free-thinking society was but it was very much like a church, um, especially very much like a Protestant church. Later on, I got involved um, with a bunch of Marxists, and I had noticed that Marxist organizations share many of the characteristics of these other organizations promoting belief systems. So that's started me thinking, and I've been thinking ever since, uh, about this whole issue of belief systems and why people uh, <coughs> adhere to belief systems. So I should first of all try and say what I mean by belief systems. Um, Tim gave some examples. Um, a mere coincidence of opinions doesn't amount to a belief system. So if you go around, let's say, and poll people on the issue, do you believe that Robin Hood really existed? You get yeses and noes. That's not a belief system. It's not elaborate enough. It's, too isolated. Um, and many, many uh, opinions that we hear about are a bit like that. Um, it always amuses me when I hear people say that so many percent of the American public think the country is going in the wrong direction. Because um, if we assume that 50% of those think it's too far left and 50% of them think it's too far right, then if you average that, they think the country is just about right. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, so we've got to be careful about what we mean by a belief system. Um, so I'm thinking about enthusiastic belief systems. I mean, I have a system of beliefs about transportation in the Chicago area. So it's pretty, it's pretty bad, it's pretty inadequate. <laughs> and it sometimes lets me down. But you could, you could lay it all out. David Ramsey Steele's views about uh, about transport, how you get from point A to point B in the Chicago, uh, <coughs> in Chicago land. Um, and it, that wouldn't be a belief system. Um, so a belief system, I'm thinking of something where people come together to enthusiastically to promote a set of beliefs. It could be religious, it could be political, it could be something else. Now, um, 
Belief systems have organizations, usually, associated with them that promote those belief systems. Um, in Christianity, these are called churches. The original word in the New Testament for church is ecclesia, which simply means assembly. It's the Greek word for assembly. Um, uh, these may be local, the local assembly, or it may be a federation of local ones, a national or worldwide system. But there are churches. Um, and we can think of political movements like Greenism or Communism or Liberalism. We can think of these kinds of movements as, um, as like churches. Um, now, I'll just mention in passing, just to dismiss it, something that is actually important. But it's not important for the pure theory. It's only important for the more higher reaches of the theory. And that is that once you've got an organization in place uh, <coughs> that promotes a belief Excuse system, me. there are going to be uh, numerous motivations open to people to join that organization, whether or not they believe or not. See, they might be romantically interested in someone who's in that organization. Or they might see a need, uh, they might see an opportunity to cultivate a business opening. Or they might just feel uh, pleasant to be in among a crowd of people in a convivial um, kind of uh, spirit. So people join churches believe, and other belief system organizations for all kinds of motives. Um, but as, as a simplification, at the early stages of our theory, we're going to assume that they all believe. And that's not, that's not too misleading. Um, generally speaking, if you've, had a lot of, if you've had a long history, as I have, of arguing with people from different points of view, you do realize that um, a lot of them sincerely believe what they're saying. Um, one of my activities is that I'm trying to combat uh, global warming catastrophism. And I find that a lot of people who think the way I do about that will say it's a hoax. Well, I don't think it's a hoax. A uh, hoax implies that the people who say they believe it don't really believe it. I think they really believe it. And that, whether that's better or worse is something uh, I'll leave open at this point. Um, so, um, and by the way, I'm, when we look at belief systems, we set aside our own opinions. So. The, the global warming promoters is one belief system. Uh, the skeptics or deniers about global warming is another belief system. Uh, and they have a lot in common. And we can analyze them, both of these movements or organizational or groups of organizations in the same terms. They, they share a lot. Um, just as we can analyze atheists and Christians, or Christians and Muslims, uh, or communists and fascists using the same analytical approach. So not everybody in, a, in an organization believes, uh, but not everybody disbelieves. Actually, that makes me think about um, The Man Who Was Thursday. Uh, hands up anybody who's read The Man Who Was Thursday. No. Uh, <clears throat> well, The Man Who Was Thursday is the best novel by G.K. Chester. Um, and, um, uh, it, there's this guy, the, the central character is someone who's a police agent and they put him into this anarchist group. An anarchist you have to understand in the sense of terrorist, right? So he joins this anarchist group and it's very tight in its cell and they're all named after days of the week. So there's seven of them. And the mysterious godlike figure who controls this cell is suddenly... So <clears throat> the police agent who's put in <laughs> Uh, to spy on this anarchist group, his name, he takes the identity of Thursday. I think Thursday, the, the previous Thursday, was bumped off by a cop or something. So, <clears throat> now what happens then throughout the story is, Thursday finds out that Tuesday is also a police agent. And then they find out that Saturday is also a police agent. And then they find out that Monday is also a police agent. And they find out there are all six of them apart from this mysterious godlike figure, Sunday, uh, are police agents. So the entire anarchist movement consists of police agents. Um, and then, of course, you, know, you don't need me to tell you the conclusion of the story, which is that Sunday is the chief of police. <laughs> and and um, it's well worth reading. It's a good story. Uh, 
You know, in the, in the 1950s and 60s, it was often said that the Communist Party of the USA was, had more FBI agents in it than any other kind of, uh, any other kind of members. And I can quite believe that. Not because it, at that point it was much of a danger, but because the FBI didn't want to be caught, by, caught out with somebody saying they knew something about the Communist Party. The FBI didn't know. So they wanted to cover their behinds by um, deeply penetrating uh, the Communist Party of the USA. Uh, so um, you can join an organization and mouth its slogans and not necessarily believe. But I think in order to understand the course of history uh, and the way belief systems work, it's, you have to assume that most believers really do believe. Now, <clears throat> if we suppose that an organization exists to promote a belief system, then the organization has to have certain aims. It has to make sure that the members continue to agree with the belief system and think that it's important enough to identify with and to help to promote. Um, it has to educate the members further in the belief system and it has to make new recruits to the organization and to the belief system so that the membership will survive the deaths of members and possibly defections of some members. So those are, it's inherent in the nature of an organization that promotes a belief system, that it does these functions. So <clears throat> you might wonder why I say that the organization has to educate the members in the belief system. Don't they already believe? Isn't that why they joined? Well, <clears throat> this leads me to two amazing features of belief systems and the organizations which promote them. Number one, most members of an organization that exists to promote a belief system don't know much about that belief system. They're extremely ignorant of the belief system. Um, now, I'm interested in belief systems, and if I hear about a belief system, I always try to find out what it is and get to the bottom of it. Um, so, um, you know, I, I've more than once had this experience. I've been talking to a Roman Catholic, and um, I mentioned that the Immaculate Conception doesn't refer to the miraculous birth of Jesus, it refers to the miraculous birth of Mary. And they said, what? What's the nonsense? don't believe anything like that. <laughs> of course, that's just what they do. <laughs> that's just what they do believe. Um, uh, when I was at university in the 1960s, I was a Marxist at that time. But there were a lot of Marxists who were a different kind of Marxist to me. They were mostly Trotskyists. And they claimed to believe in Lenin's theory of imperialism. And they claimed to be applying Lenin's theory of imperialism to the relations with the third world, the relations of advanced countries like Britain to the third world. Um, and I found that none of them had the slightest idea what Lenin's theory of imperialism was. So I had to explain to them what they believed before I could explain to them why it was wrong. Uh, and it's the same with the global warming catastrophes. 99% uh, of them don't know anything about climate or physics. Nothing. They're just like Al Gore and Barack Obama. They're totally ignorant of these subjects, as, as, as they show when they open their mouths on these subjects. Um, so they don't know um, optical depth from a hole in the ground. But they don't even know high school physics. So <clears throat> in the case of the Christians, the Marxists, and the global warming catastrophes, I have to explain to these people what they believe and then tell them why it's wrong. Because they don't know without me telling them what they believe. So this is remarkable. But um, there's this huge area of ignorance among the adherents to a belief system. Um, <clears throat> what usually happens is that someone joins an organization, they're persuaded to join it, they understand a few things about it, and they become aware that there are other things they don't know much about. But they think that someone in the organization who's older and wiser than they are has thought it all through and knows perfectly what the answer is. Uh, and then, years later, they may find to their great disappointment that that isn't true, that nobody really knows, uh, knows the answer. Um, but that's what happens. So, um, apart from that fact that, that uh, belief organizations promoting belief systems um, 
have a membership that's mainly ignorant. Apart from that, there is the point that even someone who knows a belief system very well doesn't really know it. It sounds like a paradox, right? You know, Karl Popper pointed out that no one ever understands a scientific theory. No one ever understands a scientific theory. Um, you know, in the, in the early years of the 20th century, the, 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 um, the most eminent physicist in Britain was James Jeans. And he was at a seminar, and some earnest young grad student, in a jocular fashion, said, only three people in the world understand Einstein's theory of relativity, which has only recently come out, of course, and was still very controversial. And um, James Jeans uh, screwed up his face in a frown, and, uh, and this guy who made this claim said, oh, uh, Professor Jeans, is skeptical of my claim that only three people in the world understand the theory of relativity. And Jeans re replied, well, I'm trying to think who the third one could possibly be. Um, so um, there is a long history of uh, people not understanding theories. Um, somebody said that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, that's proof that you don't understand it. Um, and, uh, you know, some theories do defy common sense and people find it hard to wrap their minds around them. Um, but um, actually, I think I understand relativity and quantum mechanics, which probably shows that I don't understand either. Now, what Popper is getting at is something much more basic, even a very simple theory like Boyle's law of gases. Um, it takes the form of a universal statement, universal law. Um, and therefore, it has an infinity of applications that no one can possibly guess at. No one can possibly foresee all the possible implications of that theory. So in that sense, no one really understands any theory. And this is true. A belief system is a collection of theories. Or it's one big theory that says that all these different theories belong together and are correct. Um, and um, nobody really can, can fully grasp those. This is a very fundamental point. Uh, and in the history of belief systems, we find that people try to nail down the essentials of the belief system. And then 10 years later, they find that that statement, that creed or catechism or confession or declaration of principles is no good anymore because it doesn't address what people are now saying. So they have to do it again. So if you look at the history of Christianity, it's one attempt after another to formulate the essentials of Christianity. You know, you have the, the creeds, you have, in the Protestant tradition, you have things like the Augsburg Confession, uh, 1350, or the, uh, the Westminster Confession, which arose during the English Civil War in the 1640s. Uh, and all these Protestant denominations have, have come up with their own attempt to capture what Christianity is all about. Um, and this is all supposed to be explicating what's in the New Testament, which, ha which hasn't changed, or hasn't changed much, for 2,000 years. But people keep coming up with reformulations trying to capture what it's about. So uh, it's actually hard to pin down what the essentials of any belief system are. And it gets very slippery. Because you want to know who you, who you have to expel for thinking the wrong thoughts. You have to have a definition uh, of what the right thoughts are before you can expel people for thinking the wrong thoughts. Or burn them at the stake, or uh, put, crap, torture them on the wheel, or whatever your preferred method of persuasion might happen to be. Um, so, um, the history of belief systems is a history of people finding that their earlier formulations weren't good enough. They have to try again to capture what it's all about. And there is an impetus in all belief systems to have a scripture. So when people come into a Marxist uh, organization, they, they're rather taken aback to find that Marxists quote scripture. They'll say, well, Marx says here, and they'll quote chapter and verse from Marx. Um, and really, this is difficult to avoid because you want to keep straight what the development of the doctrine has been. Otherwise, you're all over the place. 
So this, this leads you to be very precise. And a Marxist might say, well, I don't think that anything's true just because Marx said it. He just happened to be right a lot of the time, so I'm going to quote him where he's right. That's what a, a, a Marxist would say. But it sounds just like a Christian quoting from the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> scripture tends to arise in any belief system. Uh, that is to say, an authoritative statement, a doctrine, uh, it tends to arise because it fulfills a need. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what about the function of making converts or making recruits? Um, well, one way to make recruits for the movement is to have babies, indoctrinate them with the belief system, uh, and rear them to adulthood, and then they join the organization. Um, this is an old-fashioned method, but it's still very important in the world. Uh, in the United States, the, uh, the Mormon church, um, there are several Mormon churches, actually, there are splinter groups, but the main one is the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, it has a higher birth rate and a higher uh, population growth rate than the rest of the population. Um, and it more or less doubles in size every 20 years. Sorry. Doubles in size every 20 years. Um, and it has been calculated that if, if this goes on, uh, by the end of the century, 21st century, uh, the Mormon church will be equal to the present population of the United States. It would be 300 million. Uh, but I have to take into account there that there are more Mormons living outside the United States than there are in the United States now. So this is a, this is a big deal. So <coughs> Mormons, uh, there's nothing in Mormonism that stops people becoming active in politics. So you're going to get more and more Mormons active in politics. It's going to, it's going to, and the, this exponential sort of thing, doubling every 20 years, it means you can start at quite a low level. Now the Mormons at the moment are less than 2% of the United States population. Uh, but um, uh, it, if it keeps growing, then you can see in 50 years' time they're going to be a much bigger force. They're going to be a huge force uh, in, in, the United, in the United States politics even. So um, the point I'm making here is the old-fashioned method of having babies and making sure they, they uh, grow up in the belief system is still a very effective way uh, of, um, of making an impact on beliefs. Um, another, another group that uh, doubles every 20 years is the Amish. But of course the Amish, um, they keep out of politics. So that may not have the same impact that the Mormons will have. Uh, although of course that could change. You know, the Amish are innovative. Um, they, uh, they have a general principle of being opposed to certain types of modern technology. Hence, the, the, oh, they prefer the horse and buggy to the, uh, to the uh, automobile. Um, but they, they do make compromises. You know, there's different groups of, of Amish that make different compromises according to circumstances. Um, there was a big debate in the Amish community at one time about whether to wear suspenders, whether men should wear suspenders to hold their hands up. And, um, there's a group that came out firmly against this, and there's a group that came out in favor, but there was a compromise group in Norwich, which has one suspender. So the, the one suspender army. Um, you know, whenever, I, whenever I see something like um, the recent uh, Republican health care proposals, I think about the one suspender army. Um, I don't know why. Um, anyway. Some groups uh, stick to the method of, um, they don't really send out missionaries. I suppose the Jews are an interesting case. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, if you think about this, a Jewish missionary is like a contradiction in terms. Uh, the Jews don't send missionaries out to convert people to Judaism. But actually there are Jewish missionaries. Um, and I've sometimes been the object of their attention. And what they are is they're sects of Judaism that try to reach out to people with a Jewish background and convert them. See, I've been, I've been walking in and around the, uh, the loop, 
and a couple of guys with black hats, black coats, white shirts, no, no tie, beards. Uh, one, they'll come up and one of them will say, are you Jewish by any chance? And I, I long to say yes, because I want to hear, I collect belief systems. I want to hear what particular <laughs> sect this is. But I have to be honest. I say, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> uh, they say, don't be sorry. Sorry to have trouble doing that. Go off, you know. Uh, so, um, so there are Jewish missionaries, but they seem to be sects of Jews and they're trying to convert people of Jewish background. So there is a kind of, from a Christian point of view, the Jews can't make up their mind whether they're a religion or an ethnicity. There's a sort of quasi-national yeah, yeah. element about the Jews that doesn't exist with, say, Christianity, or shouldn't exist according to the Christian definition of it. Um, so um, an interesting case is the Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians are dying out. Um, they have a kind of a ethnicity association. It's the Parsis in a certain part of India where the Parsis live. Um, the best known Zoroastrian is the orchestra conductor Zubin Mehta. And none of his, as far as I know, he had two wives and several children, none of them uh, Zoroastrians. And the Zoroastrians are dying out because they, they won't send out missionaries to convert them. And they've, got into, they've locked themselves in by accident into a system of disapproving of mixed marriages. So they look askance at people like Zubin Mehta who marry non-Zoroastrians. But they so they don't have a me they so disapprove of that that they don't have a mechanism for bringing even the wives of their members into the, into the fold. So they're dying out, and uh, that's a great shame, really, uh, because Zoroastrianism. Without Zoroastrianism, there would never have been Judaism, and there would never have been Christianity, and there would never have been Islam. Oh, maybe it's not such a shame. Anyway, the, the Zoroastrians are dying out. That's my point. Um, so. <coughs> Um, sometimes you get just one, one organization is associated with the belief system, and sometimes there are many. Um, if you take something like environmentalism slash greenism, uh, there are hundreds of different organizations. Same with libertarianism, there are hundreds of different organizations uh, doing different functions and having slightly different beliefs but adhering to a central core of beliefs. Um, sometimes we find a belief system where there is no obvious organization of any kind. Uh, so um, we call this a movement of opinion. Sometimes we see a, a definite movement of opinion uh, without an organization, without a church. Um, an example of this would be if you, if you read about the Edwardian period in Britain, which is basically from the death of Queen Victoria on, um, there's a great book on that period by Jonathan Rose. Uh, and he brings out how there's this very definite set of beliefs that educated people had, which was that Christianity has out, outlived its usefulness. Yeah. And we need to come up with a new secular religion to replace Christianity. So this combination of rejection of of uh, traditional religion and a search for a new secular religion that would be concerned with social reform was very powerful. It's so powerful and it's so similar among so many writers that it looks like a belief system, but there doesn't seem to have been a church, a uh, separate organization that promoted it. Um, <clears throat> another, another example, I suppose, would be, say, in the early 1960s, the environmentalist movement, you know, that Rachel Carson had a huge hit with the book Silent Spring. And lots of people were influenced by that, but it took a while before definite churches were set up to promote this environmentalist creed. Um, what about the dead birds? In some cases, of course, um, it's part of the belief system that, there has, that you can only join a particular organization. So you can't sort of say, oh, I'm convinced of Catholicism, but I don't really like the Pope, so I'm going to form my own Catholic Church. <laughs> that, that doesn't work, uh, because it's part of the Catholic belief system that there's the apostolic succession laying on of hands from Jesus to Peter, all the way down to uh, Bergoglio, uh, <laughs> who's the present, the present uh, uh, resident of, of Peter's uh, post. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's part of Catholicism that you have to accept that particular 
the structure of authority. Now, the, the belief system has to try to maintain the ideas, and one of the ways to do this is to forbid people, discourage people from becoming acquainted with other ideas. Uh, so you get, in history, you get whole um, areas of the world which are monopolized by one belief system. Like in medieval times, Europe was basically Christian, <coughs> Catholic. Um, and um, the Mediterranean area, certainly the Mediterranean area, Middle East was basically Muslim. Uh, and both of those allowed a little bit of an exception. Uh, the Jews were allowed to trade uh, in, in uh, Catholic Europe, but it was always hazardous that something might, somebody might take it as life for them and start um, treating them badly. And, and in the Islamic world, the Christians and the Jews were accorded a legal recognition, but they were inferior to the Muslims and they paid a special tax and so on. Uh, but still, you've got there two systems which dominated a vast area of the world, millions of people. Uh, and imposed a monopoly. Uh, and people who came in from outside or from inside and tried to rethink <coughs> things, they, they would uh, be attacked and killed uh, or got rid of in some way. Um, so we're now in a situation in the West where that's not true, where there is no privileged group that is able to claim complete domination. And so you have a free market in belief systems. Uh, people can believe what they want, or they can believe nothing. Um, or they can oppose all the existing belief systems. Nobody's compelled to subscribe to a single belief system. Um, and <clears throat> I'm going to treat that as, I, I treat that as the natural thing, because it takes a lot of government repression to enforce one single belief system over a huge population. And it's not natural. It's, as soon as you start withdrawing the rack and the the thumbscrew and the cross, uh, you get heretics and new innovators coming in uh, with new ideas, and you suddenly have a competition of belief systems. So belief systems, I'm going to view as inherently competitive. They compete with each other. Um, <clears throat> so um, I want to go on now to talk about why we have belief systems at all. Why does this happen? Um, my answer is that there is a genetic basis for it, that people have a powerful urge to believe, and to believe in all encompassing generalities that explain all kinds of things. Um, one of the books that I recommend people read about this is The Scientist in the Crib by Gottnick et al., uh, which shows how Newborn babies have this tremendous drive to believe in something, to have a theory about the world, uh, and, then, and then to cling to that theory, but ultimately to revise it and swap it for another theory if they have to. Um, and I take that book as illustrating the fact that there is a genetic inborn drive to believe. I think this is more powerful than sex and more powerful than hunger, is the drive to believe. Uh, I think it's it's the uh, irresistible force in human affairs. People have to believe in something. And, they, and there are certain characteristics of beliefs which are better, better able to appeal to people yeah. than others. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion has been spread by the question of whether certain kinds of beliefs are favored genetically. You know, that, um, they will do research and they'll find that uh, believing in God, for example, has a genetic causation. Well, of course it does. Uh, you know, um, uh, listening to hip hop has a, a, a genetic causation. Um, doing carpentry has a genetic causation. If you look at any human activity that people are free to engage in or not to engage in, and it, this is the result of decades of behavioral genetics you'll find that genetics is behind it. In other words, you'll find that genetics is a better ex ex explanation for what causes some people to do one thing and some people to do another thing than anything else. Um, hula hoops, uh, you know, uh, anything, uh, anything like that. Um, you'll find genetics is behind it. Uh, but of course, the, 
what does that show? I mean, what it shows is if there's a genetic explanation for belief in God, there's a genetic explanation for atheism. It doesn't show that people in general are, um, are uh, moved by uh, genetic determinism to believe in God. What it shows is if you give people a choice and some people believe in God and some people don't, you're going to find a genetic association, a correlation uh, there. And um, so that's a completely misleading line of inquiry. But what we do find is that we abstract from the content of the beliefs that everybody wants to believe and everybody needs to believe. And people who say they don't believe, well, they just believe that they shouldn't believe. That's the way they get around it. They still believe, and they believe. They'll, they'll get quite upset if you contradict them. Say, no, I don't believe. Yeah, well, that's what they believe. Um, so, so there's a genetic basis for believing in something, believing in anything. Um, now, many people have written books about beliefs. Um, and um, what strikes me about these books is the way they proceed is like this. They, find, they divide all beliefs into two categories, uh, sensible beliefs and crazy beliefs. And sensible beliefs are the beliefs they hold. Crazy <laughs> beliefs are the beliefs that other people hold that they that, that don't hold. Uh, there's a book by Michael Shermer. It's quite an interesting book, uh, Why People Believe Weird Things. And you see, to Michael Shermer, it's self-evident that someone who believes in general semantics or Velikovsky's cosmology or any of those things, or Ayn Rand's uh, philosophy, uh, is believing something weird because Michael Shermer doesn't believe that. So it's weird. Um, and uh, my approach to this, I think, is revolutionary uh, and is different to all these. I say that people believe all kinds of different things for exactly the same reason. The reason that people believe in God is exactly the same as the reason people are atheists. Um, the, the reason why some people believe in global warming catastrophes is, exa is exactly the same as the reason why some people like me deny global warming catastrophes. The reason why some people believe in Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster is exactly the same as the reason why some people believe there are kangaroos in Australia. Um, and uh, so what is this thing that's exactly the same for all these people? Well, I can put it in a very vague way or I can put, get more precise. So I'll start with putting it in a very vague way. It makes sense to them. People believe what makes sense to them and helps them make sense of the world. <coughs> yeah, that's very vague. Um, now, to take a step to make it less vague, we can say that people believe something if it fits in with their other beliefs. Yeah. Um, so people believe all kinds of things. Um, I should say here that belief is a matter of subjective inner conviction. That's what belief is. It's something internal. <clears throat> it has nothing intrinsically to do with behavior. You could be paralyzed and una unable to communicate and still believe something, like the old man Noirtier in uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, so belief is something internal, subjective. It's a feeling of conviction that something is true. That's what belief is. Um, and the way we use the word belief in the language is as to refer to a disposition. You know, um, for more than 70 years, I have believed that Paris is the capital of France. Um, now, most of that time, I wasn't thinking about Paris or France, but I believed that Paris was the capital of France. Uh, what does that mean? It means that if you ask me at any point, what's the capital of France? I would have said Paris. Well, that's not what it means, because I could be lying. Um, <clears throat> but um, it, refers, it refers to an internal uh, conviction. So <clears throat> when we say someone believes something, we don't mean they're currently thinking about it. We mean that they have the disposition where if it, it occurs to them, uh, that's what they will uh, have this feeling of conviction in relation to. So if you ask me at any time, what's the capital of France? I think about it, quickly have this feeling of strong conviction that Paris is the capital of France. Okay, so that's 
what a belief is. Uh, it's a disposition to have this feeling of conviction with respect to something. Now, um, if you believe something, everybody, there's two things you have to bear in mind about belief. One is that if you believe something, you have to believe it's true. There's no such thing as believing something you believe to be false, <clears throat> because believing something is believing it to be true. And believing something to be true, to be false, would be nonsense. So you cannot believe something you believe to be false. You can only believe something you believe to be true. The second thing is this. Belief is always completely involuntary. You can't choose what to believe at any moment. Uh, if you doubt this, then I recommend you try the following experiment. Take something you believe in. In my case, it would be there are kangaroos in Australia. Um, and uh, give yourself a few seconds to prepare yourself. And now make yourself believe that there are no kangaroos in Australia. Okay? Anybody had any success yet? See, you cannot, you cannot make yourself believe anything at all. What you believe is always involuntary. Um, so people don't choose to believe things. They cannot. They see, it's impossible to do that. You can't choose to believe anything. Now, what, to be clear, one thing you can do is choose to go through the motions of acting as though you believe something. You can mouth words, or you can join an organization. You can act as though you believe that that's true. Um, but that's not believing. Uh, another thing you can do is you can take steps which will lead to you changing your belief. But the point there is, you can't say in advance what's going to happen. <coughs> When I was, um, I don't know, about uh, 26, I was a Marxist, and somebody put to me an argument against the possibility of Marxian communism. And it's a Ludwig von Mises economic calculation argument. And my immediate reaction was, well, that's an interesting argument. It's pretty powerful, actually. Uh, of course, I didn't show this. I said, that's nonsense. So to the person who put it to me. That's one thing about beliefs. People rarely admit how much they've been affected by an argument. So any, uh, any attempt to change people's beliefs, there's a delay, usually there's a delay before they admit, and before they even change, it does an incubation period. But anyway, um, so my reaction then was, well, I'm going to write an article disproving this argument. Well. Thirty years later, I produced this article only. It was a 500-page book, and it proved that this argument was true, and that, and that Marxian communism is impossible. That was my first book, 1992, uh, from Marx to Mises. So I didn't know when I set out to investigate this uh, that I would end up believing this argument. And that this is the thing. You can do things which will change your beliefs, but you can't predict how it's going to come out. And the history is full of people who have been piously committed to some belief system, and then they de decided to undertake an investigation of some aspect of this belief system, thinking it would solidify their faith, as it were, uh, and they find, to their consternation, that they start having bigger and bigger doubts, and then eventually they realize uh, <coughs> they've made a big mistake, and that this isn't true at all. Uh, so. You can do things which will lead to a change in your beliefs, but you can't predict how that's going to come out. So again, there is no such thing as choosing to believe something. It's impossible. Um, so, so I said that beliefs are dispositions, and I said that you can only believe what you take to be true, because that's what believing is. Um, now, you believe something because it seems to make sense to you in the light of all your other beliefs. So beliefs form a great network, a web, that reinforce each other. So you, anything you believe you will tend to be reinforced by many other things you believe. Um, and so if somebody puts something to you, you tend to interpret, you tend to decide on whether that's likely to be true in the context of all these huge, all these millions of other beliefs you have. Um, now this web of belief, this huge structure of your beliefs, 
is not totally static. It changes. Now, it doesn't change, usually it doesn't change dramatically in a short space of time. Uh, usually, if you take a person and give them a questionnaire and say, what's the capital of France? Are there kangaroos in Australia? How far away is the moon? Uh, and then you come back 10 years later and give them the same questions. Usually, you'll get the same answers. So there's great stability to these dispositions that people have to feel conviction that certain things are true. However, in small details, this system is always changing. You're forgetting some things, just forgetting them. Um, or you're, you find out something that you didn't know and it puts that in doubt. You, thought, you always thought it was nonsense that uh, someone else wrote Shakespeare's plays, but then you find that Shakespeare's children were illiterate. And you think, what? How can that be? So that makes you doubt and you start to think, maybe he didn't write those plays. Um, so you're always picking up occasional little things, and usually there's nothing dramatic happening. Usually the, this big structure of beliefs remains fundamentally the same. But there's always the scope for possibility of change. And then, of course, as somebody comes along, a missionary, a recruiter, a converter, a propagandist, and puts to you a case, and it makes sense to you. And so you suddenly say, yeah, that's right. Uh, planes didn't fly into the Twin Towers on 9 11. It was the Bush administration did. Uh, so it's all, this all falls into place because it fits in with your existing values. And it explains things that you found perplexing. So, um, <clears throat> belief systems have certain characteristics. And generally speaking, when people talk, if there's a big industry of people writing books and articles saying that the way people think is defective and the way they form their beliefs is defective, but these people have it all wrong. Because what they do is they find things that are absolutely universal and indeed necessary absolutely necessary. Um, and they identify these as faults, and they wish that, that they didn't happen. And it's, a simple example would be what's called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, it means that you have a belief system. And if something seems to go against it, you find a way of dismissing that and making your perceptions of reality fit the belief system. <coughs> Uh, and uh, people will talk about this as though it's an error, but it's not an error. It's absolutely essential to any coherent thinking. This is, I mean, if, if, uh, if my <coughs> refrigerator stops working, as it did uh, a few months ago, uh, I didn't start thinking, well, you know, all the, all the theories of resistance and compression of, of gases, <laughs> uh, uh, these are all in doubt. <laughs> no, I, I, did, I didn't for a moment. I, I, que I didn't question it the laws of physics uh, as it relates to a, a, a refrigerator. Um, I thought that um, something had gone a bit wrong with uh, some little part of it being replaced. <laughs> it turned out to be right uh, because it works now. Uh, after paying uh, $500 to get someone to come and replace the part. Uh, but um, so scientists don't, when you learn a scientific discipline like physics, when you learn physics, what do you learn? You keep on learning, you must dismiss common sense. This is what, this is what early, the, the first lessons in physics is all about. Uh, you know that light things fall slower than heavy things because you know that a feather falls slower than a marble. You can see that, it's everyday experience. But physics tells you that light things fall at exactly the same velocity, acceleration, as heavy things. So how do they explain the feather? Well, they bring in this saving device called air resistance. That means I've got five minutes. What, what we're saying, David, is that you know it's going to be like about 7.20, and we'd like to get some time for questions. So maybe five, ten minutes, just, you know, please. So um, science is a matter of getting, of suppressing common sense. Uh, and um, uh, and it, therefore, it's a matter of confirmation bias. So, and there is the, the point that Karl Popper made, that uh, if you look at the history of science and you've got one theory and a new theory comes up and challenges it, and there's a debate, and science is a series of debates between different theories. 
And the worst sin against science is to try to suppress debates or claim there is no debate. As soon as you hear that, you know you're dealing with someone who's anti-science. Um, Popper makes the point that even if this old theory is incorrect, the people who dogmatically cling to it are performing a service because they're showing the strength that can exist in that theory. And, and there have been cases where theories have looked as though they were about to be uh, uh, refuted and over overturned. But then it turns out that they are rescued um, <coughs> by some ingenious move. Uh, so the dogmatists who cling to the old theory are performing a service to the, to the pursuit of truth, even though they may turn out to be wrong, because they're helping to test fully these two rival theories by showing the strength, the full strength of the old theory. Uh, and th this is a point that Popper makes, and it's a very important point in the th theory of belief systems. Um, and it, it's one of the reasons why confirmation bias is not just a good thing, it's absolutely essential. Human beings could never have survived unless they're, they're one to theories uh, with desperate zeal and shown tremendous confirmation bias and be very, very reluctant to give up their things. Now, you shouldn't be totally and absolutely and infinitely reluctant, otherwise you'll never make progress. But uh, a great deal of dogmatically clinging to a theory in the teeth of apparently um, contradictory evidence is a good thing, not a bad thing. And of course, all belief systems without exception show confirmation bias. Um, so that's an example, and I could, if I had time, I could uh, look at other aspects of thinking, which is universal and absolutely essential, but which people tend to decry. Um, so, um, I suppose I'll, I'll conclude by making this point. Uh, one common view that you hear about what people believe is that they believe what they want to believe. That's, I've heard that thousands of times. Um, now, in one sense, this is obviously false, uh, because what you want to believe is that you would like the world to be much better than it is, and so you would like to believe that that's true. So I would like to believe um, that um, I could levitate. Uh, I would like to believe that I'm just as virile at the age of 72 as I was at the age of 22. Um, I would like to believe that uh, I'm going to go home tonight and and find a million dollars in used bills in, a, in a, uh, an unmarked package <laughs> with no sign of any radioactive traces or magic cards or anything like that. Uh, there's all kinds of things I would like to believe that I don't believe for a moment. Um, uh, and so I, I certainly don't believe that, uh, that the world is the way it, it ought to be. Um, so. One thing that people are getting at when they say that people believe what they want to believe is that people, is this confirmation bias, people want to confirm, the they want the theory they believe in to remain true. They don't want to give it up, and this is true. Uh, there are many interesting examples of this. This is one of my favorites. Um, the Mormons believe, if you read the Book of Mormon, that Jews came from the old world to America, and they came hundreds of years BC, three different waves, three different expositions on boats across the Atlantic. Um, and that the American Indians are the descendants of these Jews. Um, now, there are certain problems with this. Uh, but that's what, the, that's what they believe, if you take it with, with crude literalness. Um, and um, so what, what Mormons did was that uh, Mormon scholars became linguists and started analyzing the languages of American Indians to find traces of Hebrew or any old, old Chaldean or ancient Egyptian or any kind of uh, old world uh, languages. And uh, they didn't have much success at this. Uh, and they were assuming, for a long time they assumed that uh, since Joseph Smith had his visions in upstate New York and everything, they were assuming that this would be in North America, or in North America, north of the Rio Grande. Um, and um, then, of course, then they started, a, a group of them started to have the bright ideas uh, of going south. 
Um, and lo and behold, eventually, a group of these Mormon linguistic scholars found some Amazonian tribes where they thought they could tell that in the syntax there were certain parallels with Hebrew. And this is, um, this is a, a theory that these Mormon scholars have promoted and have tried to argue in the linguistics uh, literature. Now, the interesting thing about this, first of all, it shows how very rational people are. Because if these people came from the old world to the new world, long before Columbus, and settled and had descendants, you would expect to find trace of cultural traces of them. So it's perfectly rational to say, if we look, we're going to find these cultural traces. That shows they're not being completely crazy, right? Um, but the main point I want to make about this is, no one ever woke up one day and had the, had the thought, wouldn't it be delightful, wouldn't it be sheer bliss to find that some remote Amazonian tribes had certain parallelisms to Hebrew in their languages? That's not a an inherently, intrinsically delightful process. What makes it delightful is the, the way it fits into the Mormon belief system. It confirms the Mormon belief system, so they're looking for it. So in that sense, people believe what they want to believe. That is to say, they have a bias towards finding evidence that confirms the belief system yeah. they already hold. Thank you very much. All right, your first question. Would you consider a strong faith that the Cubs are going to take it this year because they did it next last year, a belief system? Tim, this is a waste of time. Um, you know, when the, when the Cubs, you know, last year, a lot of crazy things happened. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't need to remind you of this. Uh, and one of them was the Cubs winning the World Series. And when I heard about it, I mean, I take them interest in baseball, but when I heard about this, I just said to a friend, well, that's against the laws of physics. <laughs> so uh, for them to win it twice in a row, I think, would mean that we'd have to rethink conservation of momentum, uh, every, every single law of physics would have to be, would have to be reconsidered, I think. Uh, no. Theory of relativity. Okay, that's great. Excellent. we got more questioners, come on. You have someone here, Chad? Do, do, do you, do you think the U.S. government should censor the website, the Muslim websites that incur, uh, recruit suicide bombers and, and terrorists? No, I don't. I'm against censoring. I'm against the U.S. government censoring anything. I'm a libertarian. Uh, but um, uh, on the other hand, I think if people are um, making concrete, specific plans to commit acts of violence against people, there's a case for intervening. Not because they're saying something unpleasant, but because they're planning some uh, uh, actual act of violence. Can you explain our current president's beliefs? Is he just deluded on a lot of them? A lot of things he says are just well, not true. Well, like many people, them. like many people, I've had to admit in recent months that I was terribly wrong about Trump, and that, um, and that uh, I misjudged him, I underestimated him, um, and um, he always seems to be two jumps ahead of his opponents. Uh, and the crazier he seems, the more it turns out that he wins. Um, and although I disagree strongly with some of his policies, like on immigration and protectionism and so on, I think, I think what he, the way he thinks of himself as the new Andrew Jackson, who's starting a new era in American politics, I think is broadly accurate. I think we're going to find for the next hundred years, President the White House is going to hire a tweeter <laughs> uh, and they're gonna they're gonna remember with a, with not, uh, amazing affectionate nostalgia the time when this started when the president actually made up his own tweets uh, and that was sometimes very embarrassing. Uh, uh, so you know um, uh, I think I think look Trump had tr Trump had a a line. Of, one of the things about Trump is that he was amazingly explicit about policies during the campaign. Uh -huh. There hasn't been a campaign in American history 
where people have been so explicit about their policies as he was. He, he, he knew exactly where he stood on a whole range of policies. Um, and of course, he's gone against, <laughs> he's already gone against two or three of them, quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, and one of them that disappoints me uh, is that he, he had this non-interventionist uh, withdrawal from the Middle East kind of strain of rhetoric, um, uh, which he seems now to have abandoned. Um, so it, there's always a question with politicians. What do they really believe? Uh, and the more successful they are, uh, and he is brilliantly successful, um, the more you wonder about what they really believe, uh, or if they really believe anything. They just want power, you know. Uh, uh, this is, you look at Bismarck and people like that, uh, you wonder. Um, the optimistic, well, from my point of view, the optimistic view is that um, he still really believes in non-interventionism and not getting bogged down in, in some quagmire, uh, and he wants to avoid that, but that he has to get or the neocons on board by bombing a few people and making a big uh, display. Um, that's, but there is also the alternative view that he's quite prepared to get bogged down in a quagmire, uh, if that's what the general selling me ought to do. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, I haven't made a final decision about it, um, uh, except to say that before the election I thought that uh, he was, that Hillary was the lesser of two evils. I, I thought they both stank as candidates, and that's part of the reason why Trump got, um, got elected, of course. Um, but now I think I'm glad it wasn't Hillary. Uh, I, I, he's reassured me enough that uh, uh, I'm glad it wasn't Hillary. Uh, so uh, uh, that probably yeah. doesn't answer your question. Okay, Raj uh, over here had one. Yes. Uh, Raj. President Obama and President uh, Trump, they, they both are, by general consensus, they, they are not ready to be president. In New York, large number of people followed and elected them. So I'm not talking about the president, but what led, what was the psychology of the people who choose them? Okay. Why, 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 what was the psychology? That, uh, like uh, Obama, he's the second coming of Christ kind of thing. And Trump, you know, he's going to revolutionize everything. And a new millennium is going to come. What, 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 what? And people are still following him. Why? Following Trump? Yeah. You want to be disagree? Well, you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't think this is an area where I have any expertise. Uh, one thing I think is clear is that um, in terms of the polling during the campaign, Trump was ahead of everybody. He hired this super sophisticated, state-of-the-art, UK-based uh, Cambridge Analytica, and they did stuff that no other pollsters were doing with much more precision. And they used methods that are appropriate for uh, direct marketing to yeah. find out about the um, about the uh, demographics and the preferences of various voters. <laughs> and they, they were telling him he was going to win. So he knew he was going to win. And he knew he was going to win because he had the most scientific polling. Um, exactly the opposite of what everybody thinks. Um, and of course, so we, know, we know that there's this, uh, the American blue collar working class uh, has suffered a loss of real income. Yeah. Uh, which is easily attributable to uh, the shipping of jobs abroad, and which is also exacerbated by immigration. Um, and so he realized there was something here that he could reach this group and he could turn them from the Democratic Party that they voted for for 50 years to him, not, and only secondarily the Republican Party. And it, it was brilliantly right. It worked. Um, so. Um, uh, if those people turn against him, then of course he doesn't stand much chance of being re-elected. But if he can keep those people, um, which I presume he's going to, because the economy is looking up and the, the, uh, the cheap energy means that manufacturing jobs are going to come back, the coal mines are going to reopen. So all the, all these things are going to happen, and they're going to look like he's responsible, although he's only 50% responsible if that. Um, uh, so I think he will be re-elected. Um, and you'll keep the support of those people. And then the people like me. Uh, now, I would never vote for Trump. 
But <clears throat> there are people like me who thought he was so dangerous, you must vote, do anything, however desperate, including voting for Hillary, uh, uh, to keep him out, <laughs> who don't think that anymore. <coughs> they don't think that anymore. So that anxiety has gone away. The polls haven't changed. That's true. That's true. I think no. the belief so system is magical. <laughs> the polls have gotten worse. 26% he won it. Yeah, he went yeah. up. Right, right. It's in the 30s. Yep. Yep. Well, doesn't mean anything. I'm hearing Rachel Maddow on November 1st. It doesn't mean anything. That's my belief. <laughs> he goes yes. down in the polls. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we stand in the water. Yeah. It right. doesn't matter. Yeah. They went down yeah. in the polls. Doesn't Let's matter. get on to the next question. Jonathan, please. It, it, it feels like in America, a lot of times, politicians do like to use the word belief increasingly over the years. Uh, because then when facts bear out their policy to be uh, blunders and highly reckless, they can then say it was a mistake and not a crime. And I'll give you two recent examples. The Clinton administration claimed that when they had the Telecommunications Act that it would broaden the diversity of voices on public airways. And we've seen that to be a false. And the Bush administration believed that there were weapons of mass destruction under the leadership of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. So could you talk about how big money, Big power, big ego <laughs> politicians in America, they use the belief of what they're about to do in policy so that then later on when they're proved wrong, it's not a criminal act that they have to go to jail to. They could just say, well, we were mistaken. Well, I mean, I, I must say, I, I follow American politics not very closely, but quite, I, mean, I follow, certainly follow it at least once a day. Um, I flip around the news comment channels to see what they're all saying. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've very often heard a, a, an American politician say we were mistaken. And, uh, and I don't expect ever to hear Trump say that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if there's something you can be sure of about Trump's personality, uh, is that he doesn't say he's made a mistake. Right. <laughs> um, well, and, uh, the the quality of a hypocrite. Well, maybe, but I mean, the point is that's his but, he, but even if we take the Clinton mess, I don't know that I've often heard. Another I don't know that I've often heard the Clinton say they were mistaken. I mean, I think that that's not something that comes readily to the lips of politicians. Uh, they usually defend their policies to the death, and oh, yeah. beyond death. Okay. Uh, yeah. Charlie. Yeah, Wes and I have been going to monthly meetings of the Chicago Greens since the. 70s and we're talking about global warming and I'm surprised to learn that a guy like you can just show up and tell us that we have no comprehension of ecological topics. <laughs> Where did you accrue your knowledge? Did you get it, what, from the internet? No, no. The libertarian I, 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 website? No, Where did no, you I'm get your knowledge? I'm we haven't been to any lectures here at the college on ecological topics. We have them every April. A series of them, David. So, where were you? You've got to be kidding. What I was referring to was arguments I've had with people who believe. Yeah, but we don't understand that after all those year decades of lectures, you just said that we have you don't you understand global warming, but we have no comprehension, and you correct us. You don't think the ice caps are melting or not? Not really. I I want to know where do you come along. After we've been going all these decades, the here and elsewhere, heat, on this topic, the and you show up and say, oh, you heat. don't know what you're talking well, about. I, look, look, Charlie, I wasn't Where did you accrue look, your <laughs> credentials? <laughs> Fires. Libertarian okay, websites? Okay, all right. One at a time. Um, I wasn't specifically talking about your friends. No, no, we're I'm, ecological right, Charlie, people. Let him speak. You said let him speak, Charlie. I was talking the about. Greens. I've had experience of arguing at length with thousands. So I have to give classes every month because the people, everyone, is expected to pass a test on global warming. From now on, I'm going to administer a test. I have academic credentials on the topic. I have to test everybody who shows up. Absolutely. Absolutely, Charlie. <laughs> because you're wrong in the first place. What are you talking about? It's just like you. The main was that most people who are believers in global warming don't know anything about the subject. Now, you can disagree, 
you can say that they're all yeah PhDs I in totally and absolutely disagree because I think that's um, absolutely my experience absolutely is they don't know what they're talking about the anecdotal experience let's get a little rain you're relying on <laughs> all right everybody I talk to knows about global warming every everyone Okay. Aren't we supposed to have a chairman who picks these people? That's yeah. that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, over here. That's what he's doing. You, 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 you got a question? Blue striped shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Does atheist atheist theology have anything to do with the devil? No. Not intrinsically. No. Uh, I mean, there is a, there is a uh, Church of Satan which turns out to be um, a thinly disguised cover for atheism, and they don't really believe in the devil. Um, but um, in general, atheists don't believe. Most atheists don't believe in any supernatural, any spirit beings, including God, devil, uh, angels, demons, or anything like that. Next. Okay, okay you. Which one? Um, you said that uh, belief systems are subjective internal convictions. Mm -hmm. uh, what about people who are flexible in their belief systems and try to uh, base their belief systems on, say, a scientific method? Um, how, how could you call something like that subjective? Right. I mean, there are. It's possible to have uh, a belief system which allows you to change on certain issues. That's possible. So. Um, uh, still subjective. I mean, my, my belief systems are broadly compatible with scientific method. Uh, and uh, there are certain things where um, I would say if experiments and observations go in a certain direction, I would change my mind, like global warming, for example. Um, so um, but I, I think, but I do think that, um, you know, uh, you've, you've read uh, Thomas Kuhn on the uh, structure of scientific revolutions, uh, where he showed that well, this is the most influential book on the philosophy of science of the past hundred years, and he and he shows how what happens when one important theory replaces another is like is akin to a religious conversion, and he calls it a paradigm shift, uh, and uh, that is it's his book that popularized the term paradigm for this kind of general approach which can shift. Uh, now, in, when, when Kuhn started coming out with this, or shortly after the publication of that book, a lot of people took him to be saying that this was irrational. He didn't, didn't think that. He doesn't think, never thought that this was an irrational thing. But he thought it was something that was not, couldn't be, taught, couldn't be derived from the data. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, I think his, his account is broadly true. I think his account is broadly true. Um, What's the book's name again? Uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas S. Kuhn, K-U-H-N. <laughs> Yeah, we so, have could you uh, comment on the the phenomenon of the true believer? Right. Um, you think he have Eric Hoffer's book? No. Oh, it's a generally right. accepted term. Right, but it's an accept I'm accepted not term for because of the success of Eric Hoffer's book. Oh yeah. Um, and um, uh, no, I think that that was a great. That's a great book, and it. Uh, brought into public awareness a lot of issues about belief systems. I don't agree. I reread it recently, I mean a couple of years ago. I reread it 20 years ago, but then I reread it a couple of years ago. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a lot in it. When it gets down to it, I don't actually agree with it. But he did, for those who don't know, Eric Hoffer was a longshoreman. He never gave up his blue collar job. Uh, and wrote, he wrote books that were bestsellers. Um, and, um, he, um, he wrote, his most famous book and the one that sold the most was The True Believer, and it popularized this term, The True Believer. And really that's redundant from my way of looking at it because a believer has to believe that what he believes is true. But the, the term true believer has come to mean the fanatical adherent of some movement. Um, he arbitrarily confined his... Um, his study to mass movements. So he looked at communism and fascism and with 
Of course, this was the 1950s or thereabouts. So um, there were hints, discrete hints, that maybe some of this could explain Christianity as well, um, uh, which in those days was a shocking thing, so it's only discreetly hinted at. But um, it's mainly about communism and fascism. A lot of the sociological stuff in about the groups that he <coughs> appealed to, I think, are very questionable. Uh, but he did identify this, um, this element in human history of um, people who become fanatical adherents of a belief system. And uh, what happens to them, how the move, and the phases the movement goes through. But he, I, think he, I think he spoiled it by, well, he, he helped to make it a bestseller, but he also spoiled the analysis by confining it to mass movements. I think if we look at cults, which never become mass movements, like Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on, we can see all kinds of interesting things about belief systems, um, which, he, which were ignored by him. Um, but uh, it's a good book. It's, it's certainly worth reading. Why does man have to have a belief system Because it's, because it's innate. It's an innate appetite. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? When, you're, when you come out of the womb, you want to believe things. You want to find out the truth about the world. You have a desperate urgency to find out what's true. And you observe, hawk-like, everything that's going on around you. And you, you quickly arrive at certain conclusions. Uh, and then later you revise some of those conclusions. Um, and you're also, you're actually born with certain theories that you have when you, even before you come out of the womb, you've got certain theories. And uh, the research on child development, everybody should read this book, The Scientist in the Crib by Gottlieb et al., uh, which um, shows what's been discovered. And that, you know, now that you've got video cameras, instead of the older, you look at children and you try to figure out what they're thinking. It's much more scientific now because you can, you can video them and you can show the videos to independent people who don't know what you're looking for and say, now, does this child look surprised or does this child spend more time looking at this than that? So you can, you can objectively control your observations. Um, and um, so I think it's clear that human beings are born with this tremendous desire to know the truth about the world. Um, and that means arriving at true beliefs about the world. Uh, and um, uh, why, now why does this happen? Well, it presumably happens because in the course of evolution, this was a valuable survival uh, and reproductive trait. Um, and you can see how that could be the case. If there's something happening uh, to you in your environment as a biological organism, um, and you are conscious, unusually, unlike other biological organisms, you're conscious and can deliberate and make decisions. Um, for you to have a theory and to pursue that theory systematically, instead of just throwing up your hands and saying, I don't know what to do next, uh, that can be a tremendous advantage. Even if your theory isn't perfect, even if it's only very roughly true, uh, it can be a huge asset. Um, so. Uh, I would say there's no, once you, once you accept that human beings are conscious and can think and act upon their thoughts, I don't think there's much difficulty in seeing how it could be advantageous to, to believe. Now you can say, this is an interesting question. Um, if we were to design a robot to do certain things, uh, including survive, uh, we do not know, we have no idea how to give a robot consciousness. Uh, a robot that we designed would be unconscious, <laughs> completely unconscious, but we can make it do certain things uh, in a systematic reaction to things going on around it. Um, so you might say, why, can't, why isn't that good enough? Why do you also have to believe? The robot doesn't believe anything, right? Um, a robot that controls one of these, uh, robot brain, in inverted commas, metaphorical brain, that can, controls one of these driverless cars, doesn't have any consciousness, and therefore doesn't have any beliefs, but it can do things that help to direct these driverless cars. Right? So why isn't that good enough for humans? I suggest 
but that's a state, that's a question, very much like the question, why do we have to feel pain? Why can't we just have a strong avoidance behavior to certain things? Um, and if you think about this, uh, what can be counted upon to motivate you more readily than pain? Uh, and similarly, what can be counted upon to motivate you more readily than belief? You see, in other words, we're, we're dealing with here with the whole area of why people are conscious uh, and why it's an advantage. If it is an advantage, it might not be an advantage, but why it's an advantage uh, uh, to be conscious. Um, and I would say that it's part of it's part of having a theory of your um, of the world around you, including other people. Uh, that is not merely a theory like the robot driverless car, but is a matter of subjective conviction. It's part of that that makes for consciousness. So a conscious being must believe, and a believing being must be conscious. Okay. Bob, right. in the back. Um, and we'll go to rebuttals yeah. here in the next couple of minutes. Um, go ahead, Bob. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a, uh, an economics conference and a lecture I was attending. Uh, the uh, economics professor recommended a, a book on slavery and the Civil War and capitalism and you know the effect of uh, capitalism and slavery, etc. And I, I purchased a hardcover copy of the book. And I'm one of the rare people who will read an introduction. I won't jump right into chapter one. In the introduction, I see that none other than David Ramsey Steele was the publisher at the time. This book came out about 25 years ago. I can't oh, remember the title. Oh, you're thinking of uh, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. Yes. Um, What's the title of that book? Uh, Emancipating Slaves, yeah. Enslaving Free Men. Yes. Yes. Excellent book. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you, it is a terrific book. Yeah. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Oh, oh. Um, I was, the, I was uh, involved as editor, in-house in editor. Uh, I didn't write the book. Uh, I know the person who wrote the book, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. Um, and um, he is an economist and, and historian uh, and uh, lives in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, and um, recently he's, he's become notorious for predicting a default on uh, American financial obligations leading to a, a great financial meltdown. He says it can't be avoided now. Um, he's a libertarian. Uh, um, I can't say, I mean, I could start talking about the book itself and it might start coming back to me, but I don't think you want to hear my second-hand thoughts on Jeffrey Hummel's thoughts on slavery. I just want to mention anybody else in here, I recommend they pick up that book. Yeah, it's, no, it's a great book. It's a great book. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've, I've uh, heard the uh, uh, phrase, fallen away Catholic. Catholics seem to have a pretty close uh, set of ideas, but a lot of Catholics do not attend church or uh, are seem to be superficial about their religion. So what what do you think about those? Are they true believers or? Well, uh, I would say most of them probably aren't. I mean, this is a recent phenomenon historically. You know. Um, uh, in Britain, the term that's often used is lapsed Catholic. You, you often hear that used a lot. Um, and um, I would say that uh, I would say that until the 1960s, Catholics were much more inclined to attend attend services and follow the outward manifestations of their religion and Protestants were in the Western world, in, in Britain and the United States. Um, and Irish Catholics particularly so. Uh, I mean, it, it, uh, in the 1970s, when a lot of people like me in Britain started taking an interest in Ireland because there was a new IRA terrorist uh, a series of outbreaks, and there was a the um, whole question of the Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland. Um, so I read quite a bit about that at that time. And it, I read that, um, I think this was true, in the late 70s, 
uh, more than 90% of Irish Catholics attending Mass every week without fail. Um, now today, hardly any of them do. And I think, I think uh, the, the general, um, and of course, you know, you know, Ireland's big, Southern Ireland's big export to the rest of the world used to be Catholic priests. Wherever you went all over the world, you found a Catholic priest. It'd probably be Irish. Uh, now, they don't produce a single Catholic priest. Not a single one from year to year. Uh, and the, the whole culture of, of Southern Ireland now, the Republic of Ireland, is um, a latte culture, a culture of agnosticism, a culture of uh, affluence. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, certainly I would say that, the, the, I, I mean, I've said many times, the Catholic Church in the West is collapsing, just collapsing. Um, and it's collapsing especially in the British Isles and the United States, just collapsing. Thank you. If there's, uh, who else hasn't had a question? But, uh, we, we're getting ready to go to the now. Who, who wants to give a rebuttal and give our speaker a hand? Give our speaker a hand. Nice, nice job, David. You need some notes to get ready for a rebuttal. Sorry. Okay. Let's have a show of hands of who wants to give a rebuttal. Keep them up so I can count, please. One, two, three. Charlie's four. Bob, five back there. Ten, six. You seventh. Looks like seven, eight people told maybe. About four, five four minutes. Four minutes again? Yeah, go ahead. It looks like four minutes. I don't okay, have uh, come on up. Who's going to be first? You got the uh, timer, Everybody right? has four minutes for the rebuttal. Okay. And speaker, I have the last word as always. Okay, Raj goes first. Unless... <coughs> <laughs> no, he's. Go ahead. All right, Raj. Okay. Best wishes for Passover and best wishes for Easter. Who are following it? The people. Lots of people will follow a leader or a philosophy that is available to them. If there is nothing else available, in my hometown, in a neighborhood where we do not have too much contact outside, very easy contact, so we all get together and uh, sing songs and we believe in the same thing. The, the leadership resides among people. What happened to Trump is that lots of people were unhappy. They were confused. They did not find a way. And Hillary Clinton did not give them a clear answers. And uh, so Trump may not be a perfect guy, but he gave the answer and people followed him, even though I don't think he was a right guy. And uh, people follow. follow People followed uh, Moses. Lots of people did not like him. And lots of people argued with him and protested everything. But that was the only game in town. When Hitler came to power, there was tremendous need. It was, there was a place available for a leader. You know, German, German people were down and out. And they were very, very confused. And Hitler says, he simplified, he took care of their pain and said, OK, I'll solve it and I'll do that. And they believed in him, and the day he was, he was selected as a, as a chancellor, the Heidelberg, I think his name, the president, and the, the, those stormtroopers, a brown shirt, marched by, and Heidelberg said he was very happy. He said, finally there is a man who can lead German people. But th th this, this goes on ever, everywhere, even, even in Jesus, okay? If there was a tremendous need in that time, there were people looking for something. This was not the only one. There were there were lot, lots of people vying for their position. But he he was a little bit more organized, either due to Peter or due to somebody else. He was more organized and uh, he, he got his passage through and uh, it worked. Uh, like, like our uh, FDR, right man at right time, Churchill. Right man at right time with the right idea. See?
But if you know, if people, people were ready. If somebody else would have been there with a better idea or something, maybe they would have followed. You know, in a religion, I have seen people. People believe in a religion, but they don't know about it. So they are looking for something to believe in, something to hang on to the real life. Okay, in in a, in, a, in a true believer, Eric Hopper says very clearly that people want to unburden themselves, and they they will climb on any passing cause or passing train. Okay, because they 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 want to unburden them. They feel, they want to feel belong to. So many so many times, girl gets married or guy gets married. Simply because they are fed up and they want to belong to somebody. I, I had a 14 year old Spanish girl and uh, she said, I want to get pregnant. I fought with her and lots of her fought with her. University, she slept around guys and she got pregnant. And I said, You get a person. She said, No. I said, Why Why you want a baby? He said, When I have a baby, that is my own thing. So I don't have anything, but they, that baby is mine and I know it. See, this, this, is, this, is, this is general psychology. And this has been going through on probably 5,000 years or 10,000 or, or a million years. We do not know. But the rea reality is that people need to, and, and I'm worried about, I'm worried about going in the future. We are going to have less and less connected. We are going to have less and less any soldier to lean on to or anybody to believe in. You know, because belief is, knowledge is so much dispersed that there is nothing going on. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I was interested in, I, I uh, don't agree with the speaker on a lot of things, but it was interesting what he had to say about Catholicism. That is uh, really interesting to me. I think he's right, uh, although I have very little uh, proof of that. I see Catholics and they don't really seem to be interested in following what I thought Catholicism was. I was a Catholic till I was 21, so I'm 79 now, so a uh, lot different belief system. But that, that idea that uh, there's a set beliefs, they've got a catechism, I even about 20, 30 years ago reread the catechism uh, these set of beliefs and said, no, I don't believe it. <laughs> believe all those things. But most Catholics don't seem to believe them either. <laughs> That's the way it seems to be to me. And uh, the few Catholics that I know that seem to be serious about their religion sound like they might be Unitarians. <laughs> I don't know. So, so that's kind of interesting. I will say one thing, though. It is interesting, though, although I was a Catholic till I was 21 uh, and left at that time, and now I'm a UU, it's interesting that I got the seven principles of the Unitarian Universalist Church here. But in the Unitarian Universalist Church, nobody, my understanding is, nobody has to accept the seven principles. And no church has to accept the seven principles, but most of them do, or at least say they do. So uh, that was interesting. One other, the final thing I'll say, if I got a minute, is I'm reading a book called Sex and the Constitution by, uh, I think it's Jeffrey Stone. I think that's his name. And he talks about uh, stuff about the Catholic religion I hadn't heard of before. So uh, that uh, he was interviewed on, uh, C on uh, PBS uh, or uh, Chicago Tonight. So if you're interested in those kind of topics, pick up that book, Sex and the Constitution. Jeffrey Stone, he's a lawyer. Uh, there's um, <clears throat> two sides to philosophy. One is materialism, and the other one is idealism. 
materialism takes in all different types of, of human life, social life, the, the physical world, and biology. But idealism just looks into the human brain and tries to find solutions to problems by just looking into the human brain and trying to manipulate thought processes. Let's take, uh, for instance, the Orville Wright, the two brothers that first flew, first tested out flying in the United States, and it was verified through the, their ability to fly a certain amount of feet. Even if they went a block or two, it was enough to verify their principle was correct. And they, what they done, they didn't look into the human brain, and they didn't try to manipulate thoughts. They went out and looked at birds, and how birds flew. And what they done is they made their plane imitate the birds. That's subjective reality. That's not something in the human brain of thought manipulation, but it's reality. And the way to, to study anything is through reality. For instance, religion says that um, some god created the earth and created human beings, so forth and so on, but they can't base that on any scientific truth, so they base it on, fa on faith. Faith is thought manipulation, that's all it is. So if you want to solve a problem, we just don't look into the human brain and try to manipulate our thought processes, but we look at the outer, objective, material world and study it and use that study to make changes. And changes always come about. Whether we go backward or forward, there's changes in the world. Matter is constantly in the process of change. And in order to understand it, we have to look at that with scientific eyes and see in which direction something is moving and what are the contradictions in that reality and how we're going to overcome those contradictions in that reality. And then we try to verify it through the scientific method. We test it. And if we could see that it brings about the progress that you want to might only be a very small amount of progress, but it's still progress, then you have verification and we have truth. And that's what the human beings have to base themselves on, is truth. And we're trying to find out truth through religion is just a complete waste of time, or try to find out truth through manipulation of the mind is just a waste of time. We have to go into outer reality and examine it and then go ahead and build systems that are based on that reality. Um, Jonathan. There are real facts and there are false beliefs in this country right now. And uh, the reason why it's difficult for working class and middle class communities to tell the difference between real facts and false beliefs is uh, something that Edward Bernays talked a lot about, propaganda, group think, psychological warfare, illusions. Uh, the youth community has a very easy way of terming this, they say BS. What are some of the uh, real facts and the false beliefs that we've uh, been subjected to in our lifetimes recently? Well, one of the real facts is climate change is caused by human activity that is unnecessary to maintain the survival of the human species. Now, it is true <laughs> that it is necessary to continue climate change to maintain the survival of billionaires. That's true. It is true. 
that climate change caused by human activity is necessary to maintain the survival of the military and industrial complex. Yeah. It yeah. is true that climate change caused by human activity is necessary to maintain the survival of oligarchs. That's true. Uh, one of the false beliefs uh, that we've suffered under is uh, trickle-down economics uh, improves the opportunity for financial independence of working class communities. Uh, it's just not true. It never trickled down. We're still waiting for that train to hit the station. Another real fact that we've had to endure in working class and middle class community, especially the disability community, and I want all those F Emmers who are watching us on this website from the Trump administration Pence, to hear me right now. The disability community is suffering because of your evil, sick, twisted heads. Uh, capitalism has never coexisted with equality on earth. That's a real fact. Here's another false belief for all y'all who want to hear some radical truth from somebody who's a peaceful, democratic, Unitarian Universalist as well. Uh, Iraq has WMDs. That's a false belief. And we're still waiting for that train to hit the station, too. A real fact is mass surveillance in defiance of the Constitution of the United States of America that people paid for in their blood to defend when they couldn't even vote in this country like African Americans. Ah, that's a real fact. A false belief is waterboarding or temperature manipulation or isolation or rendition is not torture. That's another false belief that we've had to endure. And my favorite true fact of the all this evening, $15 trillion of waste, fraud, and abuse, 2007-2008, happened, and 99% of the criminals who conducted that treason are now more powerful than ever, and not in jail. If you've ever seen the industrial workers uh, pyramid uh, art, from the last century, uh, these brilliant artists are on a spiderweb string budget, and I encourage everybody to go in the back and get one of them. Uh, they got a pyramid of the capitalist system. At the bottom is all of us. We work for all. We feed all. And above is the uh, elites. We eat for you. And then next up is the military uh, opportunities. We get to die for the rich people. We, we shoot at you. They're, they're military destroyers. And you go a little bit up higher, you get the propagandists. We fool you. And then the next one is, we rule you. And then you got a big bag of money at the top. So uh, who in American history had something important to say about that? To finish this, great college of complexes. We have great topics. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition, and I apologize if I'm loud, but this loudness represents the bloodshed of Americans and humans on Earth who had to endure this nonsense propaganda their whole lives. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Dwight David Eisenhower, January 17th. 1961. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Matter. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, David, for another uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Um, interesting topic. Uh, I know I've I've had a, I've held a number of belief systems myself, and some of them I've come back to. Um, I can't remember if tonight now if you talk much about the the uh, the high priests in each belief system or the, the experts. I don't know if you mentioned that or not, but they exist. And, you know, the, the, you know the experts that everybody always goes to. Now I, I've since I've become a born again libertarian, <laughs> my, my go to guy is Herbert Spencer and Social Statics. His book Social Statics, the 1851 first edition. Um, that's where I go to uh, whenever I you know come up with some kind of philosophical question or problem. But that, that book explains it so well, and I read that, and I wonder, like, how can anybody not be a libertarian if they don't read that book? All, all they got to do is read that. And, you know, yeah, it lays down the whole yeah. philosophy for them. Yeah. It's right there. It's, you can't argue with it. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I've tried to, but it just doesn't work. What's the title of that book? Uh, Social yeah. Statics by Herbert Spencer, 1851. Herbert Spencer, by the way, he's the guy that coined the term survival of the fittest. Not Darwin, but Herbert Spencer. But Darwin gets credit for it. Now, speaking of Darwin, uh, I just thought I'd, this is kind of a little tiny screen on this tablet computer. This happens to be a chart 
of global temperatures uh, for send from uh, 2400 BC to the present. And where we're at right now, we're not as warm as it was in 1300 AD yet. And we're, we're about as warm as it was during the Roman Empire. So this, this is a cycle that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Now I work with a snowflake, and, and he, again, he, he shows it, it, all the symptoms of a belief system, even though he doesn't know anything about science or physics. But when I confront him about global warming, he's like, well, well all the, I mean, what do you mean? Are you a global a warming denier? All the experts say that it's, you know, we're causing this global warming. I go, well, I tell him, well, just, well, just look at this chart. I go, there was, there was no, there were no cars, there was no electricity, and we still had this, you know, global warming. I keep telling him, I go, we're in an ice age, actually. I tell him, look out the window, see Lake Michigan out there? That used to be a glacier. The glaciers are receding, we're warming up. We, yeah. We've been warming up for a long time. And, and, and thank God, too, because I would not want to be back in a little ice age like it was during the Dark Ages, or, uh, or, or, or even after that. Uh, and you know, when it's 20 below zero outside, nothing grows, folks. So I'm just not too, I'm not going to get all worried about global warming. The worst thing that can happen probably is what we're doing is maybe this will prevent us from cooling off during the next cool off cycle. Maybe that'll, you know, which I don't really have a problem with that, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, but I'm not going to jump on this, you know, this catastrophe bandwagon and uh, all that stuff because. It's, again, this is all. This is this has happened before. It's you know, it's a it's a cycle of things. Like I said we are in an ice age, and uh, this period is called a. There's a name for it. I forgot. Glacial. Uh, interglacial. Inter interglacial. So we're in a warming period during yeah. an ice age. Every twenty three thousand years. Yeah, and there's more. And there's it's even longer history. I've seen other charts with even cycles. even longer histories than that. So I'm not going to worry about it a lot. Oh, by the way, you know what usually happens? Usually there'll be some giant or a bunch of, when there's a bunch of significant volcanic activity that heaves a bunch of ash and stuff up, up in the atmosphere, that filters out the sunlight and then we cool off. That's typically what we'll, what we'll have. Am I out of time? Four minutes? Okay, hopefully uh, I'll see you all uh, next Sunday at... Uh, facets for uh, free movie and teaching. Thank you. Go ahead. Do you believe in Birch, Birchwood Plaza? All right. <laughs> you believe in the bad food there? I want to thank our resident Hoosier for coming back here and favoring us with his beliefs in, in, in global, his beliefs against global warming. Um, he seems to be going against where most of the consensus is is in fact that global warming exists um, and well, he seems to continue to want to live in a dream world in which Benjamin Harrison is still president of the United States <laughs> and in which people still read and like the poetry of James Whitcomb Riley. Um, the subject of Hasidic Jews came up tonight. Those are the, the folks that Dave mentioned who uh, the so-called Jewish um, missionaries. missionaries. Thank you. Now, I am Jewish, and when I was still working, some of the teenagers who belonged to this movement used to come into the office to try and convert me. Uh, I am, as they discovered, conversion proof. <laughs> However, they did ask me a legitimate question once, which I did my best to answer. They asked me, and this must have been in 2007, it would have to have been, because they asked me what my memories were of the Six Day War. Now, as it happened, I was 13 years old at the time. I was spending uh, the month of June with some relatives down in Hyde Park. And this was still the period when, whenever there was a crisis anywhere in the world, all three networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC, had gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the UN Security Council proceedings. So I took a break from this, and I went over to the Museum of Science and Industry, which is in walking distance where my aunt and uncle lived. And I was walking through the newspaper exhibit when the AP teletype that they had there came on, and it was the news that the Arabs had asked for an armistice. And I started to tell this story to these kids, and then it suddenly dawned on me that these kids, after all, Hasidic or not, are teenagers, and I was going to have to explain to them what a teletype was. Yes, indeed, I did my best to explain it, but I feel 
every one of my years, which at that point were 53. Uh, I since added some 10, 10 more to that total. So uh, they they don't always try to convert people, though as I said, they certainly made an effort with me to try to do that. Um, thank you. psychology, one of the leading uh, proponents of philosophy in the 20th, 20th century, 19th. Well, he, he died in what, 1958, 1960? Oh, much later than that. He died in the 1990s. He had a very long life. Russell went into the 90s. Okay. Well, I, I was thinking of it. He was 100 years old. Anyway, uh, one of his quotes I always remember, he said, if your belief is based on uh, reason, you will support it, uh, you know, with uh, reason, logic. Uh, but if your belief is based on faith, you will support it by stunting and distorting the minds of the young in what is called education. <laughs> and that's what we have across the board in with the modern society. Uh, things are put forth on TV and in schools as, as if they were real and supported by the media, and they're not real. Um, knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. At some point in the past, people didn't move more than five or ten miles away from their village. Uh, you look out over the land, it'll look flat. Before people had good telescopes, you could debate whether the earth was flat or round. Today, you can't really debate that because the body of evidence, the scientific knowledge is so great on one side that debating flat versus round earth the flat earth society uh, looks pretty ridiculous. Today, uh, you can't debate the merits of the healthful benefits of smoking four packs a day. The answer is no. The hazards are well known. They've been published for 30 years. Uh, we have smoke-free restaurants where I can come and listen and talk and give a speech because I couldn't come here before because inhaling tobacco smoke to me is the same thing as inhaling mace or pepper spray for other people. I'm allergic to it. So, and a lot of people are. A lot of a lot of kids end up in emergency rooms because they inhale secondhand smoke from their parents. The same thing is happening with the body of science and forensic forensic evidence that has been published on the recent event that was sold to us as a Muslim attack on 9-11. It's now known all over the world that that event was the largest multi-billion dollar real estate fraud in human history. They demolished seven buildings with pre-placed explosives. The whole site was prepped weeks in advance, and they filmed the first two, the Twin Towers, and they sold it to us, the media sold it to us as a Muslim terrorist attack, and then it's been off and running, attacking uh, countries that happen to have Muslims in them with oil-rich deposits and other things. That's where we're fighting terrorism. If we're going to make any progress in America toward working toward the future, we have to uh, begin to face the reality of the, the published forensic evidence. At some point, the evidence becomes so overwhelming that you can't be a denialist anymore and maintain any credibility with a straight face. Asbestos is another one. Uh, the doctors, the, the uh, incidentally, it's called the tobacco strategy. Denialism is where you pay professors to produce certain reports denying reality and then claim that there's a debate on the issue. The tobacco industry developed that back in the late 50s, and now that, that strategy is being used by the denialists of uh, the fossil fuel damage to the earth, uh, the, the people that deny that global warming is happening. And uh, the denialists are outweighed by scientific evidence by about 97% of the the, uh, the side of science, the three percent among the denialists. So uh, we have our work cut out for us, and uh, also we have to realize that Donald Trump, referring to him as our elected president, is a misnomer. Donald Trump was never elected. 
he lost the election. He lost the electoral college vote, and they changed the vote totals after midnight to install him so that the right wing cabal that is running this country, the billionaires, whatever you want to call them, they served up a whole list of people for Donald Trump to point, putting a you know, so-called fox in charge of the hen house. Well, he's found the meanest, nastiest, ugliest fox he could find for each federal hen house, in other words. We never know, if, you, if you're 100 years old, you haven't seen a government like this in America. So uh, the resistance is getting bigger on many different issues. We're gonna, uh, we'll get an earful next week from Dennis Nelson about the benefits of solar, wind power, and how the world is going green. Uh, and also, I will bring uh, several pieces of information on environmental issues, and also the latest stuff that came out of the Wall Street Journal and everything else about the total, complete bankruptcy and collapse of the nuclear power industry. <laughs> Nobody is building new nukes anywhere in the world unless they are propped up by massive state welfare money. Nuclear welfare is, it's, it's, one article called it the biggest welfare queen since Ronald Reagan talked about welfare queens in the 80s. <laughs> so that's where we are. So let's move forward, people, and uh, let's have a good discussion next right. week, too. Thanks. And I, too, hope to have a good, reasoned discussion about our energy future. I do not come to this nuclear belief that I have, or what I call certainty of the thorium revolution, without testing, without inquiry, without not looking at facts and figures. Andy is absolutely right about one thing in describing what the light water reactor is and how unsustainable the light water reactor and the nuclear power industry is in its present form. But there are several ways of doing nuclear power, and it can be done safely, it can be done reliably, and I hope to point out next week that it is a viable option, and that if we really want to get off oil and really want to get off fossil fuels, you best take a good, long, hard look at thorium especially the liquid fluoride thoria, the liquid fluoride molten salt reactor. When you're running any type of belief system, you should take a look at the science behind it. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be going to a service at Springbrook Community Church, celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it's impacted the world. And I am a true believer. I had a what they called the classic born-again conversion experience my sophomore year in school. I believe that every man is a sinner and needs to be have God in him to forgive him of sins. And I believe that everything I know about Christianity is testable, provable, and in a court of law would be succinct. I hope to speak on it at length sometime, but I do know that Sometimes I might suffer some form of evidence bias myself, but I hope to recognize it and learn from it. In next week's debate, I have been looking at exactly what Andy's been saying about some of the claims of solar and wind, and I just don't think they're going to cut it. But again, let's have a reasonable debate based on facts, based on science, and based on some good, solid scientific evidence. I look forward to debating Dennis next week. I'm kind of hoping to smoke him, but I don't know if that's going to be the case. But anyway, Andy, thank you very much, and I'd like to sit down and, and so the last one, I guess. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess you're the last All right, word, let's baby. get the last oh, one. Right. All right, Charlie. All right. Are you going to be eclectic? I think he yes, always I is. I am. That's, a, that's like a speaker. Another nice topic there. <laughs> And beliefs. Uh, the Lithuanians, yeah, Happy Easter. The Lithuanians have a belief that if you bury an Easter egg on Good Friday in your backyard, and if you return 20 years later, the yolk will have turned into a diamond. So I did this. I'm going to see if it works. <laughs> now, this is only a belief. But anyhow, what's the belief? It's an assertion lacking verification.
test their measurements. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, I, I guess the canon of human knowledge is full of these. Um, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, I, I, these climate deniers, I was going to ask you, um, in, just as an estimate, how many gallons of fossil fuel were burned today? <coughs> And you feel that there's no effect on the environment, right? By burning a billion gallons and creating soot like you wouldn't imagine, and other gases, That's and why contributing you these and for a hundred years, and to say, well, it's not going to have any effect. What makes you think it would have any effect to burn a billion gallons? Of fossil fuels. That's why we need to get out of Charlie. And, and nothing is going to happen. That's why well, we in 1980, I still remember this. They asked eight universities <laughs> to ascertain if there was global warming or not. Every single one of the eight universities came back with an affirmative uh, declaration that yes, global warming was in fact in progress and we better do something about it. Uh, libertarians have been trying to deny it for political reasons. Um, I don't understand this. You know, the, you know, the first time I, I did never really understood the aversion of the right wing to the Greens. And I still remember my first experience, Rush Limbaugh came on the radio, and my sister had me listen to him. And I heard him critical of the environmental things. <laughs> and I really didn't understand it. I said, why is he opposed to environmental stuff? I just didn't comprehend it. I mean, I, I grew up with Silent Spring. We had the effects of acid rain killing the trees. We saw what was happening to the Great Lakes, killing them, making them dead bodies, the greatest bodies of water on Earth, one fifth, one fifth of the fresh water of the world, polluted beyond imagination, and to say that we should do nothing about it. Now, they say when I was trying to search my mind, when they established departments of environmental, I believe it was environmental science. It was not environmental beliefs. This was not like humanities. This was science departments. And now you come along, you deny it and refute everything that they come for. Um, I, I don't understand that. Um, there's some other things that are, that are happening ecologically. Just last week, I posted a thing like they're actually measuring the plastic, the microplastics that are coming off automobile tires. It doesn't sound like much, but you take 50 billion auto tires, little bits of plastic, that all ends up in the oceans where it doesn't disappear. This is an environment to say that nothing's happening. But anyhow, uh, we're way beyond it this time we act. Stop discrediting people are trying to achieve. Um, we, we're faced with a, 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 a dire situation here. What's this guy saying? He, he's like here, I hear, well, warming is good. You know, we yeah. try to grow stuff in the desert. <laughs> are you for real? I, you know, we have a different perspective, I think, in Chicago here, because it's not the fragile aspect of the environment. But maybe if we lived out west or in the northern climates or something like this, we'd have a different perspective. Uh, but we're city people, and uh, I think we've got to be like the Indians and have a, a very, we, the Indians are fearful of nature. They're kind of uneasy about it. They, they don't, we turn it like the Christians. The earth is that, ah, who cares what, whatever. They, they have a totally different view on it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Good hearing from me again. David gets All right, the last word. David gets the last word. Don't worry about this global warming, though. No, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> All right. Give us your last words of wisdom, so Mr. Steele. A few things out of the many of um, Well, I'd, I'd say this about the comparison between Trump and Hitler. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, of course. Uh, uh, protectionism, economic nationalism, 
uh, immigration control. Um, uh, but above all, the, um, the idea that one person can be trusted to uh, fix everything, and he's not going to tell you how he's going to do it, because that would warn our enemies. Um, so there is all that. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Hitler movement before 1933 um, had lots of uniformed people in the streets beating people up, uh, openly announced that it was going to get rid of democracy and establish an authoritarian state in imitation of what Mussolini had done in Italy, uh, and uh, you know had a lot of uh, characteristics that the Trump movement doesn't have. Uh, I would say if Trump was 30 instead of 30 something instead of 70 something, uh, and if we were on the brink of huge calamities, which would be you know like terrorist attacks killing thousands every day. Uh, comparable to the sort of thing that was going on in Germany in the 20s, uh, then I would say, you know, there was a, da a Hitler danger from Trump, but I don't think there is any danger like that from Trump. Um, so, um, although, you know, all economic nationalists have a great deal in common. Um, I, the Wright brothers didn't base their principles of flight on studying birds. I mean, um, I don't know much about aerodynamics, but I do know enough to know that that's not true. Uh, the, the, a fixed wing aircraft, heavier than air, air aircraft, doesn't work on the same principles as, the, as um, flapping with the, the birds. Uh, uh, but, and uh, you won't get much of guidance from studying birds. Um, so let me say something about this global warming stuff, uh, because there seem to be a lot of misconceptions out there. Uh, first of all, I don't think anybody disputes that there has been global warming over the past couple of hundred years. You know, the, the global, uh, mean global surface temperature has gone up by about a degree Celsius over the past couple of hundred years. Uh, coming out of the Little Ice Age, which was one of the coldest episodes of a hundred years, to a, a couple of hundred years of the coldest it's been in the past few thousand years. Uh, and we're still coming out of the Little Ice Age, and it still isn't as, as warm as it was in the medieval warm period. Um, so um, th there is this oscillation between warming and cooling, as we descend, there's a long-term descent into a new glaciation. So in the long term, over thousands of years, it's getting colder. Uh, and nothing can stop the new glaciation. And remember, when you get glaciation, it means that there will be ice here that's several kilometers thick, and there will be no Chicago and nobody living here because of the ice. And that will last for 100,000 years. 100,000 years, 10 times as long. The, the glaciation as the interglacial. So <clears throat> that's if the pattern of the last half a million years or so is maintained. If you don't think it's, if you think it's going to somehow come to an end, then um, uh, that would be wonderful. I mean, it would be great if we could warm the environment by burning fossil fuels. That would be great. We should burn as many as we possibly can to try and stave off this glaciation that's going to reduce the world's population by 95% and force us all to live near the equator. Uh, uh, but, uh, there's not, but unfortunately, there's absolutely no evidence that uh, slightly increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has that kind of effect. Um, so, um, you know, this, the, 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 when, you hear, when you hear the 97%, what you should always remember, you should always remember a much more important statistic. 67.3% of all statistics are just made up. Just remember that. Um, you just make that <laughs> <laughs> so if you remember that, if you remember that, then that puts the 97% into perspective. It's absolute nonsense that 97% of course, it depends what you're asking. If there, it ha there has been global warming for the past 200 years, yes, nobody disputes that. Increased carbon dioxide will make a contribution to warming. Nobody disputes that. What people dispute is that, it's, is that the end of the world is coming because of a minute increase in the amount of carbon dioxide. Uh, and um, so um, that's what's disputed. The catastrophe is what is disputed. Warming generally improves people's lives. You don't get deserts through warming, you get deserts through cooling. Because it, as it gets warmer, it gets wetter. Yeah, that thing it, is there are many warm, wet periods in the Earth's history. There are no warm dry periods in the Earth system. All that good it's always cool right? and dry or sure. warm and wet. It's oh, yeah. like sex. Sure. Warm and wet or cool and dry. <laughs> One of the two. You don't get the other combination. <laughs> if it's hot, it's wet. Now, um, 
you know, really? Yeah, so, <laughs> Did you have to say that? You know, um, do you actually know what you're talking about? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, he does. Uh, he does. Life, we were a long life of experience, but believe me. <laughs> now look, um, I don't know how many times I have to say that nobody for the part, nobody in the European sphere of influence for the past 3,000 years has believed that the Earth is flat. They knew, the ancient Greeks knew that the Earth was round, and they measured the circumference of the Earth quite accurately. So. Um, and, uh, and this was general knowledge to every benighted peasant in Europe in the medieval times. Nobody thought that the church didn't preach that the earth was flat. They preached that the earth was stationary at the center of the universe, and that was wrong. Uh, but they didn't preach that the earth was flat. Flat earth uh, is, didn't, hasn't existed for thousands of years in the European sphere of influence. Um, now, the... the, the um, Who's responsible? If you, if, if you take the view that putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere causes dangerous warming, right? Some people think that. Not 97%. No, Remember the 67.3% that I told you about. Yeah, right? had a whole and you can, and you can take that to the bank. If, if it's true, let's suppose it, true. it was true, that minutely increasing the amount of carbon dioxide, right, it is it's now at, it's now at four, 400 parts per million. Right, that means right. four ten thousandths of this stuff is carbon dioxide. Now, uh, if, it's, if it's true that that's going to cause the end of the world, it's going to cause catastrophe, right? Who's responsible for this? Who talked us out of nuclear power and made us so dependent on fossil fuels? It was the environmentalists, the Greens who did that. Okay? That's they right. were the people who sabotaged nuclear power. That's right. Uh, Right. And, uh, and the pacifists and, and the peaceniks. There is, there, now look, the you, can, you can believe, you can believe, <laughs> you can believe in solar power, you can believe in wind power, you can believe in witchcraft, you can believe in faith, you can believe in prayer, you can believe in the Ouija board. All of these are worth exploring as alternative sources of energy. But there are actually only two choices if you want a modern economy with That's all right. these good things yeah, like cars and so on. And that is nuclear or fossil fuels. What and, happened in trouble? Uh, what in so what we, I've said many after. times before, we want nuclear <laughs> we want nuclear for about eighty percent and the other twenty percent fossil fuels. The reason we need the fossil fuels is because nuclear is cheap, it's safe. But it's inflexible. See? It's inflexible. Where were you? Uh, you uh, uh, okay. So, every, every, okay. He says I've got to wrap it up soon. So, everything I say is true. Give me a hug. All right. Take us out, Mr. Adjournus. Are you adjourning us? Heather, get around right here. What? Are you adjourned? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Are you adjourning? Oh, yeah.